and welcome to the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast, where we explore the latest in life extension and anti-aging science with a dive into a month's worth of insights and new breakthroughs. This podcast is a combined effort of the Life Extension Advocacy Foundation, which operates Lifespan.io, and Future Grind, a podcast that explores the ethics and impact of emerging science and technology. I'm Ryan O'Shea, and I'll be your host. In addition to scientific advancements, August featured our Ending Age-Related Diseases Conference, so let's jump right in and learn a bit more about that. This year, our conference was entirely online, with two full days of talks from professionals from both the research and investment fields. We will be featuring talks from the conference in the coming months, but a few have already been made available. Here's a taste of the conference's introductory talk from Lifespan.io president, Keith Comito. Last year, when I closed the conference by mentioning the importance of being aware of broader societal moments relevant to our work in overcoming age-related disease, I had no idea that a truly significant historical moment would soon find us. The COVID-19 global pandemic has affected us all and is the reason we are all here today, such as we are. And it's good that we are here, that we keep the flow of scientific information strong, because our collective work to address the root causes of the aging process and disease has never been more important. As many of us already know, age is the single greatest risk factor for COVID-19, just like it is for almost every disease. And this not only creates opportunities for us to engage the public in our work, but also serves to highlight the exact areas of our field that need to be developed in general in order to hasten the end of all diseases, infectious or otherwise. We need to continue improving upon our growing understanding of the root mechanisms of aging, translate the knowledge we already have into therapies and interventions that can affect it, build and make use of clear and standardized biomarkers that can measure these effects unequivocally so that we can make the value proposition of addressing aging itself undeniable to investors, policymakers, and the public at large. And that value proposition is undeniable. The demographics of the global population are growing ever grayer, and this trend is projected to accelerate in the coming decades. And yet this is coming without a meaningful increase in healthy life expectancy, but rather an extended period of sickness and ill health that is poised to imperil the economic sustainability of the world, as the infirm will depend on society and loved ones to care for them, as they should. We've all known this for quite some time, But what we didn't know, or perhaps what we knew but didn't fully attend to, is that this same problem also leaves us vulnerable to pandemics such as this. And while it's absolutely correct for the scientific community to mobilize and solve this pressing problem as fast as possible, it is incumbent on us all to recognize this wake-up call, to understand the deep flaws in our healthcare system this moment has made clear, and to work on addressing the root causes of disease, including age-related immune system decline, which will make us more healthy as a society and more able to resist all diseases, pandemics included. The cost of inaction is staggering, yet so too are the benefits of action. Thankfully, the world appears to be starting to recognize this. Despite the pandemic, or perhaps because of it, investment in biotechnology and the creation of new startups is continuing to move forward, and this includes life sciences. We can attest to this ourselves at LEAF, as the influx of promising aging research companies seeking to join the pitch meetings of our longevity investor network has never been greater than it's been in the past few months. And this shift in focus is catalyzing real results, with each step of progress bringing closer the promise and anticipation that we're drawing closer to it, the first breakthrough to result in significant extension of healthy human life. National data sharing initiatives are forging ahead to meet the present moment as well, with large-scale healthcare data systems being created to facilitate all kinds of research, and which pave the way for new types of crowdsourced clinical trials more suited to the modern world. With advances in technology emerging to support this, working to address issues of data privacy and standardization, while bringing the power to track meaningful biomarkers of aging right into your pocket. We at LEAF are doing our part as well not only by continuing to support early stage research by crowdfunding, but also by engaging the public with large scale video projects, press appearances, and through our news articles at lifespan.io, which have honestly seen an astounding increase in traffic over the past few months. 
This increased visibility will hopefully enable us to reach new heights on our next crowdfunding campaigns, which you'll be hearing about in the near future, one of which actually being an in-house research project of LEAF involving the architecture of chromosomal DNA, which will be an exciting new first for us. Furthermore, we've completed last year's plans to merge our news outlet and crowdfunding site into a unified platform, which not only magnifies the effect of any of our initiatives, but also brings more features and tools to you so that we can all work together more effectively and invite even more stakeholders into our community. Such as the ability to clearly see the organizations in our field, who is working with whom, detailed information on the types of interventions they're working on, and the news articles that involve any of this information. And as our community continues to grow, it also, in turn, empowers our initiatives that outreach to an ever wider audience, such as our new Facebook and YouTube shows, Science to Save the World, and Lifespan News, our weekly news show designed to inform the public on the latest credible research to overcome the diseases of aging. And public perception is changing. In just the last few years, we've managed to interact with over 12 million people. And perhaps in part because of such efforts, the percentage of the American population, for example, who believe that extending healthy human lifespan is plausible and desirable has increased significantly. We are now at the turning of the tide, and this allows for new opportunities, press appearances and conversations that couldn't have happened a few years ago, books that couldn't have been written a few years ago, and powerful organizations that have not historically focused on aging turning their attention to this most important issue. And this could not happen soon enough. You've all heard me say this statistic before. Over 150,000 people die every day, and over 70% of this due to the diseases of aging. Over 100,000 people. But where do we really draw the line on what is an age-related disease? What does this number become when we add to it the deaths due to COVID-19, which is surely an age-related disease? What does it become when you add influenza, or even things you wouldn't normally think of, like car accidents or suicides? Almost everything is an age-related disease. And what this moment in history has made clear is that our work to overcome the root causes of age-related disease has more value to society than even we imagined at first. That's why I'm excited to share that we're going to be launching, by the end of this year, a large-scale initiative to drive this value proposition truly home to the public and policymakers, involving the writing of position papers with clear, specific, desired outcomes, powerful social media initiatives to raise awareness for this, and significant press attention. There was a concept put forth some years ago, the longevity dividend that sought to illustrate the vast socioeconomic benefits to be gained from addressing aging directly, in addition to the positive emotional and ethical effects of doing so. If there ever was a time for this message to be heard, that time is now. Because as powerful as the benefits it sought to illustrate were, it had no considerations for the additional benefits of mitigating infectious diseases and pandemics like this. Reducing rates of transmission and improving the efficacy of vaccines through better immune systems. Lessening economic damage through shorter necessary lockdowns. And creating the therapies needed to repair the damage caused to even those who recover, such as lung fibrosis. Furthermore, these focal points allow our field to meet the present moment in all ways. We hear the people when they say, it is not okay to sacrifice the elderly. We recognize the voices of the past that warned the burdens of an aging population would be disproportionately borne by women, by minorities, and by the poor. And we move forward into the future in solidarity with all humankind to work to solve the current problems at hand in a manner that brings true and lasting health to as many people as possible. Because truly it is a world where all see the benefits of therapies to overcome the diseases of aging, where we all see the most benefits of these therapies. There are also new episodes of our show, Lifespan News, hosted by Brent Nally. Here are a couple segments from that. Have you heard of the European Longevity Initiative? Well, recently, Attila Chordash, a longevity biologist, philosopher, as well as the founder and director of the United Kingdom startup Age Curve, collaborated with Longevity Technology to share his opinion about the European Longevity Initiative. 
Attila believes that now is the right time for a focused longevity advocacy group at the European Union. The association aims to bring attention to the issue of healthy longevity, educating both the public and lawmakers on recent discoveries on the biology and malleability of aging. For our next story, at a recent symposium on aging biology, a debate was held on whether or not we know what biological aging is, and it revealed several points of disagreement among the 71 participants. Unfortunately, there was not only a lack of consensus on the core question of what aging is, but also on many tenets of the field of aging. Areas of major disagreement included what participants viewed as the essence of aging, when aging begins, whether aging is programmed or not, whether we currently have a good understanding of aging mechanisms, whether aging is or will be quantifiable, whether aging will be treatable, and whether many non-aging species exist. These disagreements highlight the urgent need for a unified and cross-disciplinary aging biology paradigm to allow research to proceed more quickly and efficiently. For full episodes of Lifespan News, you can visit our website or YouTube channel. And now for a research roundup. Sirtuins often have a reputation as longevity promoters. Sirt2, for example, helps to maintain genomic stability by deacetylating histones. However, a new study has shown that the Sirt2 protein increases the accumulation of amyloid beta, a known marker of Alzheimer's disease, in the brains of mice. The results of this study highlight the multifaceted character of cellular chemistry. It seems that deacetylation both promotes genomic stability and also drives amyloid beta production later in life. Therefore, caution is needed when developing novel drugs and anti-aging therapies. Since the 1950s, a popular osteoarthritis treatment has been microfracture therapy, in which a minuscule injury is inflicted in the joint region, triggering tissue regeneration. This therapy is far from perfect, since the regenerated tissue is fibrotic and only vaguely resembles healthy cartilage. However, a new study suggests that by administering bone morphogenic protein 2, and simultaneously inhibiting the vascular endothelial growth factor pathway, in combination with microfracture therapy, we can stimulate the formation of mostly normal, healthy cartilage in mice. By combining novel methods with this almost 70-year-old therapy, the researchers were able to overcome its limitations, and this technique may be on the fast track for approval and deployment. The body can be home to many latent viruses, which can lie dormant for years only to be activated much later. Now, researchers may have the solution to one such persistent virus, herpes simplex virus 1, which is commonly known as oral herpes. Using gene editing, researchers at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center removed HSV1 from infected cells in a new mouse study. The animal model showed at least a 90% reduction of the virus in the nerve tissue where the virus lies dormant. This reduction of the virus, which persisted for at least a month following treatment, may even be enough to allow the immune system to defeat it and prevent it from returning. The team found that when using a single pair of gene editing scissors, the virus was able to repair itself, but with two cutting proteins, the DNA of the virus was destroyed beyond repair. These twin DNA scissors were delivered to the HSV1 infected cells using a harmless deactivated viral vector, which is able to infiltrate the target cell to deliver its payload. The researchers are also testing a similar approach to treating the related and more serious herpes simplex 2 virus, which causes genital herpes. A new mouse study has built on the positive results of previous research, taking us another step closer to telomerase gene therapy in humans to reverse pulmonary fibrosis. Telomerase gene therapy activates the production of the telomerase enzyme, which repairs the telomeres located at the ends of our chromosomes, restoring the sequence and building up the protective cap. The telomerase therapy used by these researchers at the Spanish National Cancer Research Center has been demonstrated to successfully treat age-related fibrosis in old mice. This new study shows that age-related telomere attrition naturally occurs in alveolar type 2 cells, a key player in lung tissue regeneration. As well as regenerating lung tissue, alveolar type 2 cells also secrete a lipid protein complex called pulmonary surfactant, which lubricates the lung tissue, helping it stay elastic as it expands and contracts during breathing. 
This means that if the alveolar type 2 cells are unable to regenerate, then the pulmonary surfactant will not be produced, which causes the lung tissue to become stiff and fibrotic. The researchers show that there is a direct correlation between telomere function in alveolar type 2 cells, pulmonary surfactant secretion, and the development of fibrosis in animals. This research holds great potential and may offer a solution to many types of fibrotic disease. The next steps will be to translate these findings to people, and we are confident that human trials for telomerase gene therapy are not too far away. This research was also the subject of the August Journal Club, which you can find on our website, alongside more information on anything mentioned here in our research roundup. And now for some news nuggets. One of the more promising startups to recently emerge is Siniska, a company born from a lab at the University of Exeter's College of Medicine and Health. Siniska has a particularly intriguing approach to addressing the harmful senescent cells that cause havoc as they build up in our bodies with age. Rather than destroying them through senolytics, they intend to reset senescent cells to allow them to regain their function. Siniska is initially going to be focusing on skin aging using topical treatments that aim to rebuild the skin structure. This is a wise initial move for a proof of concept, as the skin is the largest and most accessible organ in the body, and positive results should be visually apparent as well as reported via biomarkers. Ultimately, Siniska plans to expand its technology into wider pharmaceutical use to target diseases that currently have no cure. The company is now in the process of raising a seed round and is seeking over $1 million to get the company started and through its initial year of development. There has been some disappointing news from Unity Biotechnology with the release of its Phase 2 results of a senolytic trial of its candidate drug UBX0101. There was no statistically significant difference between any arm of the drug and placebo at the 12-week endpoint of the study. Given these results, Unity does not anticipate progressing the drug into pivotal studies. UT Health San Antonio has received a $2 million grant to study the effects of rapamycin on Alzheimer's disease. The grant will enable a double-blind, placebo-controlled clinical trial in which 40 individuals with mild cognitive impairment or early Alzheimer's disease will receive a daily dose of either oral rapamycin or a placebo and undergo a regular battery of brain health assessments. The brain workups will include cognition assessments, magnetic resonance images, and more. That's it for our news nuggets, and that's it for this episode of the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast. Thank you very much for spending another month with us and for your help in the fight against aging. Whether you're donating, spreading the word, or simply listening to our content, we appreciate your help. Remember to subscribe, leave a review, and post about us on social media. This will increase our reach and introduce more people to the importance of life extension science. Don't forget, you can get additional deep dives into science, technology, and futurism on the Future Grind podcast. Find out more at futuregrind.org. Once again, I'm your host, Ryan O'Shea, and on behalf of the team at LEAF, we wanted to thank you for joining us. We hope to see you next time on the Rejuvenation Roundup podcast. Oh.